we're here in Walnut Grove, California, right after the pear harvest, and uh, we're fortunate enough to be able to spend part of a day with Tom Wiseman with Grow West. Uh, morning, Tom, good to see you. Morning. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your background, what you've done, who you are, so that the viewers can uh, kind of get a feel for your accomplishments in your life? I was born and raised here in the Delta, and my dad had a small ag chemical business, so I was raised in, in this industry. And uh, I've been working in it since I got out of UC Davis for 42 years now. Wow, 42. That's, that's good stuff. It, obviously, it's done well for you because you look like you're about 38. That must be the, <laughs> that must be the water skiing that goes on every morning on the Sacramento. <laughs> yeah, I do like to do that. It's, <laughs> it's my workout. Yeah. So with this tight delta ground, real close to the Sacramento River, what would you say the number one limiting factor for growing a crop soil-wise? What's it limiting most? Oxygen. Oxygen. Now you've had a little experience with this calcium that's a pound or two per acre. When you first heard about a pound or two of calcium per acre, what was your first thought, honestly? Well, it raised my eyebrows. <laughs> You're being polite. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you've had experience on some honey crisp apples. Yeah, we put out some, some small test plots in, in, in a few areas and uh, using the test equipment to try and see if we, were, we could measure. And the mo one of the most striking things was in the Honeycrisp uh, block where we were having about 50% loss to bitter pit, which is a calcium-related disorder uh -huh. in the tissue. After... Uh, two two pound treatments in one winter which was so significant four pounds of calcium total on a per acre basis yes we uh were pretty taken back at harvest the next year after those applications basically zero bitter pit and that was uh good news you know for for the grower and for myself yeah. it was it was a so when help me out here you're saying four pounds of calcium applied in the, the fall within one year equated to going from a 50 percent bitter pit incidence to not no bitter pit in essence there was only a few apples that we could find that had bitter pit i mean i mean a handful in in the, the whole area do you think that was coincidence <laughs> uh, and you know, anybody, anybody with a good agronomy background that has worked in, in the field, when they were, when, if they were to hear four pounds of calcium, they're used to putting out tons. But your approach is different with your product. You're, you're basically allowing oxygen in the soil so the microbes then can mine the calcium that's in the soil. We're not adding the tons to put in the soil. It's there, it's just not being available. And that's our problem here. We have anaerobic conditions with too much water, and then we have even poor water penetration when we do irrigate. And so we're not getting the microbial activity to move the calcium to a high calcium demand variety yeah. like Honeycrisp. It is noted for bitter pit issues, Yeah, the genetics of that apple. What did your grower think with the bitter pit reduction? Other than being tickled. Yeah. He was uh, pretty excited about it, yeah. Shocked and excited, yeah. So with what you saw on Honeycrisp apples. And if I remember right, when we were out there, we, uh, 200, 200 is the biological zone, PSI, 300 is the root zone. When we went out to that field, 
it was dirty, rotten, nasty, hard, tight ground. Yeah, very and, similar to what I think you got. Right you'd there. say it, it's similar to this. And now how many times do you think, and these are narrow wheel tractors and implements, how many times a year do you think this gets driven on right here? 25 to 30. And I'm pushing down to 300 PSI. Mark the top. There's the aerobic zone. Less than an inch. And you think this soil has an oxygen deficiency? <laughs> 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 so we're going we're gonna to go right in the middle where I'm guessing very, very little traffic has been. Yes. Oh, shoot, we've got almost an inch and a, and a half. <laughs> so then just, just to play devil's advocate, we'll come over to this side. The other wheel track, a little bit softer, and then we'll go up on the berm. I'm pushing to 300. That's what a root can push through. Now, this is similar to what you, had, what you saw a year or two years ago on the Honeycrisps. What is the, what was the aerobic zone on the Honeycrisp apples after that four pound or the two two pound calcium applications? It was about four and a half inches. Okay. And and you know kind of if you went after an irrigation, it was much deeper than that. Um, so I'm kind of still unclear about really how to. I think I, obviously you should try to get the soil to the equivalent moisture every time you measure, yeah. it seems like. But uh, I noticed that with where, where before, what I'm trying to say is even with moisture, it was much, much harder. Uh -huh. But after moisture, you could go like three times as, as deep, yeah. maybe a foot. So it made a big impact on the soil, in yeah. my opinion. The one thing that, that I hear growers say from time to time is once we get the soil squared away, it doesn't stay. It keeps reverting back and you'll get, you'll get crusting and clotting. And there's been several growers here in this area as well as other, other areas of the world and they're saying, why do we keep getting this crusting? Well, when we dig down, you'll see just a, an absolute jungle of feeder roots. And this tree and all trees, the top two minerals they want are calcium and phosphorus. And I, so I tell guys, I said, when you're putting calcium out topically, it naturally wants to go down with water. So it will leave you until you get microbes there to digest it and put it into humus, storable nutrients. And the roots of these trees are looking and electrically attracted to the calcium. So every, this isn't a synthetic bunch of crap that's going down on your ground. This is as close to elemental calcium as we can get. It's going to disappear. So like what we talked about earlier, there will be a repetition of replacing what gets harvested off to keep the soil structure correct, to keep the microbes happy, and also keep the calcium tissue content of the plant in at least a 2% or more. Do you remember tissue, tissue-wise calcium? I can't remember on this block, actually. I, I, but to make it even worse, of course, we have high magnesium. Yeah. And so I, I'm telling my customers exactly what you're saying, that we're probably gonna have to stay on a program for quite a few years to try and, and move the magnesium levels that are excessive yeah. in, in the soil, but that, that's the only way we're going to eventually get away from the terrible compaction and yeah. the reoccurrence. Yeah. The other thing that we see a lot of growers have never thought about, every mineral has a personality, and we've talked about this before. Magnesium is one of the electrolyte minerals. It is very electrically active, and it will, in excess, when magnesium is in excess, it will tie up nitrogen on a one-to-one -one basis. In some of your growers, you're seeing fire blight. What do you think the fire blight, what's starting that? Well, we've, we've always had fire blight, you know, especially in certain varieties that are susceptible. Um, and we, 
because of this tie-up that you're talking about of nitrogen, we need nitrogen and we add nitrogen as nitrate nitrogen. Calcium nitrate is our typical program to, to give us the calcium that we need for good fruit production. And so we don't have to put lime or gypsum on every year. We usually do two, two applications of calcium nitrate and that gives us probably uh, more aggravation or, or promotes fire blight because excess nitrate creates soft fleshy growth and you know the mm -hmm. the cells leak sugars under the microscope and that's what the fire blight bacteria lives on are those leaky cell walls that have sugar yeah. and then to top it off our average climate is increasing average temperature during the fire blight season in the spring and so we're in the in in the sweet spot it, and it's exponential um, the amount of bacteria you get from just a couple degrees of average temperature rise during that time of year. And we've had warmer, warmer weather. And so the fire blights become an orchard killer. Thus we spray two times a week, sometimes more, with oh. just fire blight materials for eight weeks, sometimes 10. From, from spending your life out here, do you think that opening the ground up with a available calcium could potentially help reduce the fire blight by tying up the magnesium, making more natural nitrogen available? Yes, and that's, that's the goal that we're after in this test plot we're doing on the other side of this ranch. Um, because this is a high density orchard, you can see how close these trees are together. Um, the ground is strong. We're adding nitrogen to it to get the growth and the size of the fruit that we need to meet the market demands. So we're putting on a lot of nitrogen and it's in spikes and it creates even more excessive growth in these spikes instead of like just natural daily needs, demands. Yeah. And our, our goal after trying to use chemicals to reduce all the shoot growth, because you don't realize Shading will eliminate the development of new buds for next year. So all during the growing season, this is growing so rapidly, they have to come in and prune it back to allow light in or you don't get the bud formation that makes the tree fruitful. Mm -hmm. And the labor is so expensive. We tried chemicals, Apogee and a generic Apogee that they use in apple industry. You can spray that on and it stops the growth of, of the shoots for three to four weeks, kind of just stops them, yeah. creates closer inner nodes. But the pears don't react to that that way, that about 10 days and then they start growing again. <laughs> and we were up to $600 an acre in chemical treatments trying to suppress that growth. Ouch. And it really wasn't viable. And so long-term the, the thinking is that we can't do it with chemicals. If we could balance the nitrogen it will probably reduce this surges of shoot growth that we get from our nitrogen applications. Mm -hmm. And thus we can reduce labor and keep the tree more in a natural balance and hopefully reduce fire blight from, yeah. from this excessive growth. Well, so, if, if you stopped bitter pit and honey crisp apples with four pounds, it'll be curious to see what we can do with four pounds on fire blight. Yeah, and then long term, as you've talked, if we can get the bricks down, in, uh, up, excuse me, in the sap, mm -hmm. these bacterial diseases like fire blight do not like high sugar environments. Yeah, yeah. And m maybe we can see some suppression of disease. It'll take us a while to get there, you know, as oh. you've said. Well, and I just see a. a a beautiful pair that was too small to be picked. <laughs> Here, here's what we always look at, and this information a lot of people haven't heard of, but this goes back to the 1850s. If you take a pear or a plum or a peach or an apple or a carrot or a radish or a tomato or whatever it may be, about while it's on the tree, about 80% of it is water weight. 
If you take that water weight away, because that's a variable, what you have left is dry matter, solids, what, what the processors for tomatoes and different things are looking for. At 20% of the solids, 47% of those solids, the plant wants to be carbon. And here's where, where your uh, statement comes in. 43% of this plant, dry matter basis, wants to be oxygen. 4% of this plant, it wants to be hydrogen. Well, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, 47, 43, and 4, we're already at 94%. We haven't mentioned nitrogen yet. Nitrogen is 3%. We're at 97. And all the minerals that are in the soil make up the last 3%. So your statement about lack of air, microbes need air. What we breathe every day in the air is 78% nitrogen. And a high pressure front pushes that down into the soil if it's less than 200 or 300 PSI. Nitrogen, oxygen, CO2, and this is where the carbon sequestration that so many people are talking about. You just mentioned you're warmer out here. Do you think there's anything to this climate change? <laughs> 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 yeah <laughs> we're living it yeah the 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 high, higher levels of co2 being at 415 parts per million uh back in may of 2019 it's got a lot of people concerned this plant these plants this piece of fruit are recipients of sequestered carbon so as, as you open up the soil on the, on the Honeycrisp and now on, on the pears, and you get air down in there, you're actually gonna take more CO2 out of the atmospheric air, run it into the soil, and create food with it. So your farmers are gonna benefit by their soil being opened but you not really doing anything fantastic other than being a good man and a good company, being honest with them. Opening up the ground will help with their efficiency. Yes, I think that's correct. And whether it be a, a larger pear, whether it be a monstrous reduction in bitter pit, it all comes down to financial. It's got to work on a, on a dollar basis. Or less fire blight. You know, yeah. these nitrogen applications, <coughs> especially in some varieties, create this excessive growth. Yeah. And it needs to be more balanced and we won't get that tissue that's so susceptible to fire blight. Yeah. So we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot trying to get size, we create more disease. And, and there's gotta be a better way. Yeah, it's, it's the industry. The researchers, that wrote books back in the mid 1800s would say this plant wants to be carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, sugar. Sugar being the, the result of photosynthesis. Calcium and phosphorus are the two minerals needed for these pears, um, the, the honey crisps, grapes, cherries, whatever crop, calcium and phosphorus is needed for photosynthesis. If a plant doesn't have enough carbon and oxygen like it wants, it needs more nitrogen. So back to your statement again, the number one thing that's deficient in, in this area of California, oxygen. oxygen. Is there anywhere else your soil can get oxygen than from air? From water. Ah, good point, H2O. H2O, and we see some, you know, obvious, effects of water, but I believe a lot of it is, is oxygen yeah. also. Yep, yep. And good healthy soil, if someone were to Google good healthy soil, 25% of healthy soil should be air, 25% water. Mm -hmm. Those need to balance. You're not gonna get water penetration unless you already have air in the soil. And, and we have, as you know, very good alluvial soils here. With oh with a good environment and organic matter to promote microbes. Yeah. That, that's why I think the first and, and 
most cost effective thing that we need to address is this oxygen problem because th everything else then will function if we could just get oxygen into the soil. Grow West is, is a large company. You have a lot of suppliers, manufacturers coming to you trying to sell things. How many companies have gotten to you to tell you, it's like, we need more air in the soil? <laughs> My it? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one. Here's the thing, and hats off to you and your company for, for even looking at this, because most companies, it's like, well, if air goes into the soil, everything becomes more efficient. We sell less stuff. Most companies aren't interested in that. Before the name change, Grow West, the Lyman Company, and I'll never forget this, your sign in front of your building said, Safe, Sustainable Solutions. Something a lot of companies won't say, definitely won't put on a sign. It's not just about you guys selling something, is it? No, I've been doing this for a long time, and you know the old saying that you're only as strong as your customers is, is very true. And the health of our growers is number one, and everything else will take care of itself uh, for us. There's plenty of products that we sell in our portfolio for different needs, for different situations. Um, we just need a healthy client there every year and uh, that's kind of our mission. Uh, it is our mission and our responsibility as PCAs is I see it to uh, to do all we can to keep them healthy. And it's it's not just chemistry, it's not just physics, it's economics. It's what, what things cost and what they give back and how it all fits together. Well, and it's with, complicated. Yeah. With the changing markets, all of a sudden you say this is about a, is this another one, 120? Yeah, I'd say so. And they want, they want three sizes bigger than this. If they can't grow these, they don't have a market. If you don't have a healthy tree, you don't grow, you don't have big pears or a big pear. <laughs> yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> the way crops have been grown is becoming less effective. Can I, is, that, is that fair to say? Or the chemicals aren't doing the job they did before? I think in, in a lot of instances that's true. Yes. <clears throat> or it's taking more chemicals or more financial inputs for the grower to get to harvest. Yeah. A, a lot of my key growers that are really on top of things, I think, have noticed that we're, we're increasing our inputs and we're actually getting less yield. And part of the less yield can be that we're striving for more size, but we're even getting less size than we were say 10 years ago. So it, I believe it, 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 our, our soil is not as resilient, as giving uh, as it has been before to handle the uh, torture that we put it through in a growing season of all the adversity. Yeah. 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 And you know, every day counts for energy and, and getting size. Yeah. So it's, uh, and again, everybody has a budget and how do we address this? You know, we can't spend hundreds of dollars an acre on things that are giving us less than they used to. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the short time that you've been introduced to our calcium, how confident are you that on compacted soil, which you, which you did before on the, on the honey crisps, can be replicated here? Well, I've actually got about six total um, plots in, in wine grapes, pears, cherries, apples that I've been watching, and uh, I've got a good response out of every application. Uh, now, are you sure that's not just coincidence, Tom? No. <laughs> <laughs> because of this tool right here. Yeah. 
I mean, I, you have to have to have a way of measuring it scientifically. And you could go, you could go to those areas that we treated, you know, and even with just a couple pounds in one season, we would get, you know, a hundred percent difference in the, in the soil, um, basically hardness versus untreated. Most companies don't talk about air in the soil for the microbes. You're one of the few that realizes oxygen has to be attached to every mineral to get it from the soil to the plant. As we go forward, air, if you, if you think about it, so many companies are selling all these trace mineral packs. And you probably have a fair bit of trace mineral in the soil that if the air gets there and allows the microbes to break them down, things work. Yeah. Like I said, we, we have great soil. We just are limiting the vehicles that need to pick up the right passengers. And <laughs> There's a, that's a good way of putting it. And take it, like you said, you got to have an oxygen to move each one of those. Yeah. And it, without it, how it could be in the soil, everything can be right. Without oxygen, it's not going to move. Does any, on a day-to-day -day basis in your world or in plants or in microbes or soil, on a day-to-day -day basis, is there anything more important than air? No. no. If you could shorten up a few passes down, down, these, down these rows, a little, little bit less traffic, because you have a little healthier soil, a little healthier plant, do you think a few less passes through through this orchard would also help as far as reducing compaction? Well, a few less out of 25 or 30, I don't, I don't know may, if it's may, going to not. Good point, good point. You know, in our situation, that's why I think we're going to have to put this product on at maybe lower rates continuously yeah. to fight this compaction. and. and the way we're having to control diseases right now with the frequency of spraying, it creates a tremendous amount of traffic. But we also are on it in the springtime when we have to spray for disease management and it's wet conditions that you would, sometimes I've got growers making two and three foot ruts. You can imagine tearing, oh. tearing roots out of the, the aerobic zone. It's amazing the trees look as good as they do. Yeah, yeah. Because the at the at the time some sometimes the river is up very high and the water table's almost at field capacity, yeah. and we're dragging sprayers through to to fight the fire blight. It's structurally devastating. Well, and you you made a good statement. If somebody's get getting a beaten, say I just hit you twenty three times. Would three times less hits made a difference? And like, yeah, not really. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm getting beaten. That's why I kind of see it as, as an ongoing problem. Yeah. But if we use it continuously, we, we're knocking that magnesium off, always getting that down. It should be a diminishing thing over time. Yep. But we're still going to structurally create issues if we're on it when it's too wet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every open ground grower knows that. You know, you can see yeah. compaction marks the next season. When you go in and harvest, there's plenty of examples here of harvesting corn in the fall when it's wet, mm -hmm. creating compaction. And in in, sometimes I've seen it two and three years down the road in the same field. You see the tracks of the harvester from that season yeah. when it went through with a full hopper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard so to get rid of it. Soil has a memory. It won't let you forget what you did to it a year or two or sometimes three. We've also done studies that compaction absolutely messes and drops your organic matter content. We've seen organic matter drop one, two, three percent in a heavily compacted field in one year. It's just, it's amazing what that does. So no wonder there's no microbes. Yeah. And with tight soil, th this, that excess magnesium, and I call magnesium the problem child, but it, it likes to just grab onto stuff. So number one is grabs onto nitrogen. So many times nitrogen applications are less efficient, they have to put more down. Number two, magnesium is a problem child by making soil tight and airless. 
not allowing microbes to do their job because they breathe in like we do. They breathe in air and give off CO2, carbon dioxide, which makes up 90% of a dry matter weight of a pear or a plum or a peach or whatever you're looking at. And if these, if these trees, any plants, get more CO2 taken in, do you think they're going to give off more oxygen? Yep. No. But wait a minute now. If you breathe in more air, are you going to give off more CO2? If you're breathing heavy, larger volume. Right. So if a plant takes in more CO2, common sense would say it's going to give off more oxygen. So in the climate change, the higher CO2, more CO2 taken into the plant, give off more oxygen at the end, it's a double win That's right. on the climate. That's right. So you, you guys, you as, as well as Grow West, are earth friendly, ecological, and sustainable, and you're concerned about the future carbon footprint. Absolutely. You know, I mentioned to you before, a lot of our clients are family farms, farmers. Yeah. I've got some sixth generation farmers. Sixth generation. That's, that's good stuff. And they can't just pick up the farm and move it. <laughs> and we all realize that. So the soil is the asset. Let's yeah. take care of it and do it right and be sustainable. Uh, that, that's the future. And we have to do that, and, and Grow West will be there with our partners, our clients, uh, because there's always things to address on the farm. Yeah. It'll never be perfect anyway. We can strive for it. you got to swing for the fence, though. Yeah. <laughs> so the natural approach you guys are taking, you're hoping the next six generations will be as, as successful as the first six. You'll be here for a few more generations, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> but I just like the whole idea of, of uh, being a steward of the soil. And I think most modern farmers and our children have the same concept. Uh, we, we are stewards on this earth. And, uh, never perfect, but keep striving. Leave it better than when we got it.